Good evening, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> we live in a world where news reports invariably highlight the negative. It's almost impossible to pick up a paper or turn on the evening news without being bombarded with reports of governmental corruption, terrorist attacks, gang violence, abuse, or the atrocities of war, just to name a few. The dichotomy between the present reality and the scriptural ideal of Zion seems to be an ever-widening, yet the promise of a new Jerusalem, where the saints live in paradisiacal glory, punctuates the scriptures with a recurring rhythm that reverberates in our souls. The Apostle John knew what it was like to live in troubled times. At the end of the first century, many members of the church found themselves embroiled in political and religious conflicts. Life as a Christian was, at best, difficult. As John introduced himself in the opening chapter of Revelation, notice his message, which becomes the foundation for the entire book. And I quote, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, close quote. For me, this verse is a pivotal key for understanding the book of Revelation. John wants to impart to his audience a sense of the grace which is possible through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the inner peace which comes from a knowledge of one's relationship with God. These are the elements through which John could offer comfort and hope to a people desperately in need of it and should, I believe, be an important focus in our reading of Revelation. One of the gems of his literary legacy was to provide some keys on how to bridge the spatial gap between present reality and future possibilities. In other words, the book of Revelation shows us how we can use the promise of the future to successfully negotiate the present. Historically, Revelation has evoked tremendous interest, even though its message is couched in symbolic in imagery. It seems to me that this imagery can be both a blessing and a curse to latter-day readers. On the one hand, it can be a blessing in that it paints a vivid picture of the struggle between good and evil throughout the Earth's existence. But on the other hand, however, it can also be a curse in that sometimes we can get so caught up with trying to specifically decipher its symbols that we can leave ourselves with neither the time nor the energy to get beyond those symbols and appreciate Revelation's underlying straightforward messages, which are that we are not alone in our struggles and that God will eventually vindicate his covenant people. With this end in mind, I would like in this paper to leave aside a symbolic interpretation of the events of the seven seals, the six trumpets, or even the seven plagues, and even the descriptions of the beast and the red dragon. Others have done excellent work in these areas. Instead, I would like to specifically examine the ways in which Revelation seeks to convey comfort and to instill a sense of hope for those at the end of the first century who were experiencing tribulation because of their religious beliefs. Once we examine this pivotal aspect of the book of Revelation, we will briefly discuss three specific lessons that we as saints, living on the cusp between the 20th and 21st centuries, can draw upon for our own inevitable encounters with, with tribulation. First, the message of comfort. Tonight I would like to briefly discuss two Im important visions that are embedded in the larger revelation that John received. The vision of the seven candlesticks and the vision of God's throne. If we look at a basic overview of the book of Revelation, the importance of these visions becomes apparent. In this outline, we can see that the two major sections are chapters 2 through 3, that include the letters to the seven churches, and chapters 5 through 18, that describe the opening of the seven seals. Both of these sections deal extensively with tribulation and judgment. But before each section, John describes a vision that is critical for understanding what follows. In chapter 1, verses 11 through 20, John describes the vision of the seven candlesticks that the angel informs us represent those seven churches. And in verses 12 through 13, we read, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. 
John then attempts to describe the glory of the one like unto the Son of Man, who verse 19 clearly identifies as Christ. Do you grasp the poignancy of this vision? Before talking about their tribulations and judgment, the Lord wants the people to know that regardless of their situation, he is in their midst. He will be there for them. During his mortal ministry, the Saviour promised the saints that, quote, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst of them, close quote. Now he was gone physically, but certainly not spiritually. As one scholar cogently notes, Christ is no absentee landlord. I love that, that concept. Christ is no absentee landlord. He does not leave us stranded during our mortal trials and tribulation. He knows what we're going through. Alma prophesied to the people of Gideon that Christ experienced all of the difficulties of a mortal existence so that, quote, he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities, close quote. Christ never promised that we would somehow be immune from tribulations. He certainly was not immune from them. Do you remember what he told the prophet Joseph? The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? What he does promise, however, is that he will be in their midst and he will succour his people according their infirmities. Could he give a greater promise than this to his people? The second major section of Revelation is also introduced with a vision of divinity. <clears throat> and we read in Revelation 4, verses 2 and 3, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto emerald, an emerald. John's expressive language again attempts, however inadequately, to capture the glory and magnificence of God. In Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, we learn that the throne upon which God sits represents judgment. It is therefore an appropriate precursor vision for the opening of the seven seals. What is interesting in this description is that a rainbow surrounds the throne of judgment. For the ancients, as indeed it is for us, the rainbow symbol is rich in meaning. It harks back to the original rainbow that God placed in the sky after the great flood. We are reminded of an earlier time when God's judgment came upon the earth because of its wickedness. But the rainbow was not the symbol of God's judgment, but rather of his mercy, because it represents the promise that God would never flood the earth again. In a similar manner, the Lord seeks to assure John and his audience that although his judgments must come upon the earth and its inhabitants the saints can take comfort in the fact that God's great mercy will temper the requirements of justice. Amulek taught that it is through Christ's atoning sacrifice that, quote, mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety. I love that passage too. That is just absolutely gorgeous. Thus, although subtle in nature, Revelation provides at least two messages of comfort for those in the midst of tribulation. Number one, whatever our circumstances, Christ will be in our midst. And number two, God's judgment will be tempered by his mercy. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. God loves his people and is ever mindful of their situation. Viewed in its proper perspective, this message would have provided great comfort for the struggling saints at the end of the first century and indeed should do the same for those who are at the end of the 20th century. The Lord's message is not only one of comfort for the present, however, but also one of hope for the future. And in Revelation, he offers this hope on two levels. The cosmic level, dealing with the fate of the world as a whole, and the micro level dealing with individuals. Both of these levels are related to each other like two sides of a coin. 
On the cosmic level, Revelation promises that, this, that Satan will be destroyed. And Revelation chapters 19 and 20 graphically describes that defeat. As a result, Revelation tells us that Satan will be bound during the millennium and that after the judgment, the earth will be transformed into its celestial glory. What is interesting to me here is that in Revelation, Satan's defeat only occurs after the marriage of the Lamb. In chapter 19, verse 7, we read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Close quote. The question that occurs to me is what is the relationship between this wedding and Satan's defeat? The answer, I believe, is an important element in understanding the Lord's message of hope for his people. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, the bride represents Christ's covenant people. Notice how in verse 7 specifically reads that the bride, or the church, hath made herself ready for this wedding. As with any wedding, there are tremendous physical preparations that need to be tended to. In our verse, the church must make spiritual preparations to enter into that covenant relationship. If we return to the letters given to the seven churches, we gain some insight into what those spiritual preparations entail. In every letter, the Lord tells the churches that they must, quote, overcome, unquote, Satan's machinations. The Greek word used throughout John's writings for overcome is nakao, meaning the overthrow of an opposing force with a success that is palpable and manifest to all eyes. In other words, the church's readiness is an active affair. They cannot just sit back and wait for Christ to come and take care of everything for them. Instead, they must be actively invite, involved in the fight against Satan. Both individually and collectively, they must prepare themselves by denying Satan's access to them. Nephi taught that we can only achieve this state through personal righteousness. In his epistles, John expounds further. He tells us that those who have overcome are those who have been born of God and who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The saints receive power to overcome by actively making Christ's atonement a force in their lives. Herein lies the crux of the matter. The overcoming of Satan is a partnership between Christ and the saints. That is why the next verse in Revelation 19 reads, and I quote, And it was given to her to be clothed in fine linen, bright white and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteousness of the saints. As Wilford Harrington notes, the dress itself is a gift from Christ, but its fabric is created from the righteousness of the saints. Those who enter into a covenant relationship with Christ and become his brides are those who, are, who according to Revelation 19, 11 through 14, also join with him in the final assault in, on Satan. Let's read ver those verses. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and upon his head were many diadems, having a name written that no one knew except him. And he was clothed in a garment dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, wearing fine linen, white and pure. Close quote. Notice that the armies are wearing the same clothing that Christ gives to his bride. It is through overcoming Satan on a personal level that we are prepared to assist in overthrowing him, him on the global and cosmic level. What a beautiful promise of hope for the future. On the other side of the coin, the Lord's message of hope is also that as the saints overcome, they will receive exaltation or eternal life, which gift the Doctrine and Covenants tells us is the greatest of all the gifts of God. It is again in the letters to the seven churches where this gift is delineated. Each of the Lord's promises to the churches highlights different elements of exaltation. 
Notice how, in each instance, the symbolism allows for an economy of words. But as we shall see, the same symbolism also conveys a richness of information. Each promise adds detail to the glorious picture that John paints for us. Let's spend a few minutes unpacking packing each promise so that we can bask in the majesty of the overall promise. The Lord promises the Ephesians that they will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We know that access to the tree of life was cut off after the fall of Adam and Eve because they did eat of the fruit, they would, because if they did eat of the fruit, they would have become, according to Alma, immortal in a fallen state. The fact that the Ephesian saints will, will partake of the fruit indicates that their sins no longer impede their access to eternal life. The saints in Smyrna are promised that they will not be hurt by the second death, which John later describes as being cast into the lake of fire. Notice, however, the contrasting promise for those upon whom he says the second death hath no power. They become, and I quote, priests of God and of Christ and reign with him during the millennium. For many saints to whom John wrote, persecutions made the first death a very real possibility. But John's emphasis is not on mortal conditions. He wants the saints to view their present tribulation from an eternal perspective. The saints in Pergamos are promised that they will eat of the hidden manna and that the Lord will give them a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Manna was the miraculous way that God provided physical nourishment for the Israelites as they journeyed through the wilderness. The Israelites collected part of that manna and kept it in an urn in the tabernacle. It was thus hidden from the congregation at large and became, as Philip Hughes writes, both a symbol and a promise of the true bread of life that was yet to be given. Close quote. Then in his bread of life sermon in John chapter 6, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He that overcometh, that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And later in the same chapter, he says, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The promise that the saints would eat of the hidden manna means, therefore, that Christ would provide their spiritual nourishment. His atoning sacrifice would provide everything that the saints needed for exaltation. Having partaken of that manna, the saints would then receive a white stone with a new name written upon it. The prophet Joseph um, informs us in section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants that uh, this stone is a Urim and Thummim, which is given to those who enter the celestial kingdom so that they can know of the things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms. The prophet doesn't say much about the new name, only that it is a key word, but it does play a significant role in the ancient world. Receiving a new name often indicated some kind of change in status. The fact that the new name is known only to the individual recipient also draws upon ancient beliefs that knowledge of another's name elicited power over that individual. According to Porter and Ricks, hidden names served two purposes. First, they prevented evil powers from gaining control over an individual. And second, they were a key to permit the initiate to enter into the true fold of God. Here, therefore, the fact that the saints are given a new name which no man knoweth seems to indicate two things. Number one, they are no longer subjects to the powers of Satan or anyone acting at his behest. And number two, they can enter into God's presence. This must have been an especially compelling blessing to people who had experienced persecution from both political and religious parties. The Lord promises those who overcome in Thyatira that they will have power over the nations through two related means. First, they will rule with a rod of iron, which Nephi learned was the word of God. Second, they will receive the morning star, which John later identifies as Christ himself. In other words, the saints will eventually join with Christ and rule the world through his power. 
Rome, for all of its grandeur, for all of its ability to affect the lives of the saints at the end of the first century and beyond, was merely a ship passing in the night of eternity. There was hope for the saints. The saints in Sardis are promised that they will be clothed in a white raiment, that their name will not be blotted out of the book of life, and that Jesus will confess them before the Father and angels. The significance of the white robes can reflect both purity and victory, purity from the sins of the world and victory over Satan and his minions. During the description of the events during the sixth seal, John sees the, the 144,000 and a great multitude of people clothed in white who stand before the throne of God. When John inquires about them, the angel declares that, quote, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, close quote. The robes have become white because they made Christ's atonement efficacious in their lives. As a result, Christ acts as their advocate before the Father at the time of judgment. Elder McConkie teaches that to be enrolled in the book of life means that the individual will participate in eternal life or the kind of life that God lives. The saints in Philadelphia who overcome are promised that they will become a pillar in God's temple and he will write upon the saints the name of God and the new Jerusalem and Christ's new name. The temple is the place where God dwells. The promise of becoming a pillar in God's temple, therefore, is the promise of becoming a permanent fixture in God's presence. Elder McConkie described the significance of being inscribed with God's name and, and um, Christ's new name. He says, and I quote, God's name is God. To have his name written on a person is to identify that person as a God. How can it be said more plainly? Those who gain eternal life become gods. Likewise, he says, Christ's new name shall be written upon all of those who are joint heirs with him and shall signify that they have become even as he is. Close quote. These saints belong in God's presence in the New Jerusalem because they are gods. It's therefore not surprising that the last promise given to the Laodiceans is that they will be enthroned beside Christ and the Father. All of these promises are promises of exaltation for the saints who overcome. And later in the Revelation, John receives a glimpse of the time when these promises are all fulfilled. And he says in Revelation 21, 3 through 5, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Revelation gives us a peek into eternity and what it is like. The Lord could have easily told John to write to the saints and tell them to endure to the end so that they could then be exalted. The message is the same, but the power of revelation comes from its detailed description of possibilities. What does it mean to be exalted? According to revelation, it means that through the atonement of Christ, we can overcome the limitations of mortality, which we all experience because of the fall. We can rise above the power of Satan and his minions. We can be purified from our sins so that we can dwell in the presence of God and thus inherit all that he has, including the privilege and responsibility of Godhead. This indeed is a message of hope for those in the midst of tribulation. Okay, we have now examined Revelation in terms of its message um, for the saints at the end of the first century. But what about its relevance as we approach the 21st century? 
Although Revelation was originally sent to seven specific churches in Asia Minor, the number seven also suggests that its message was for the entire church because it has the meaning of completeness or wholeness. The scriptures teach us that tribulation in any age is an integral part of mortality. Lehi taught Jacob that it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. Similarly, the Lord instructed Joseph Smith in Doctrine and Covenants 29 that it must needs be that the devil should tempt the children of men, or they could not be agents unto themselves. For if they never should have bitter, they could not know the sweet. Close quote. In fact, at another time, Joseph declared that, um, that men have to suffer, that they may come upon Mount Zion and be exalted above the heavens. Tribulation is the refiner's fire. And Elder Maxwell reminds us that there, that there may be variations in our trials, but there are no immunities. The question then should not be why we have revelation, but instead how can we deal with it when it comes? In the latter question, I believe that revelation provides three powerful lessons, regardless of whether the tribulation we experience is global or personal in nature. First, despite the turmoil that, we that may encompass us, Revelation teaches us that we can have confidence that Christ is in our midst. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is his church and he plays an active role in it. He is not, as we have noted, an absentee lord landlord. That position alone should give us great comfort. On the macro level, we can know that the church is in good hands being led by Christ's anointed prophet and apostles. On the micro level, he is also there with us and we can turn to him in every situation. We should never forget the vivid picture that John paints for us of Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and he will sup with me and he with me. If Christ is not by our side, then we can be sure that we are the ones who have moved away. In times of tribulation, we should take comfort through turning to Christ. Instead of allowing ourselves to be encompassed about by the cares of the world, we should instead turn to Christ and be, as Ammon declared, encircled about with the matchless bounty of his love. Second, we must be actively engaged in the fight against evil. The Lord told the saints in the the seven churches that they must overcome in order to inherit the blessings of eternity. Likewise, we cannot afford to passively sit by and watch our society gather momentum on Satan's slippery slide of eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Edmund Burke captures the essence of Revelation's message when he wrote that, quote, when bad men combine, the good must associate, else they will fall one by one an unpitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. The brethren have asked us to be actively involved in our neighbourhoods and communities. They understand well the collective power of individuals who unite in promoting the cause of good. Third, we need to realise the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the catalyst for lasting peace. So much of the tribulation we face in this world originates when either people either willfully or ignorantly break God's commandments. Cecil B. DeMille, producer of the classic film The Ten Commandments, warned... We cannot break the Ten Commandments. We can only break ourselves against them. If we want the paradisiacal blessings described in Revelation, we must understand that Christ is the ultimate power that overcomes the forces of evil that we encounter. In his first epistle, John wrote to the saints that they had overcome Antichrist because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Richard Draper reminds us that for all of its military symbols, Revelation clearly depicts Christ as a lamb who overcomes Satan through sacrifice rather than military power. Political sanctions and alliances will never bring about the peace described in Revelation. John saw that the saints of God overcame the red dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. What the world needs today is people who live the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Alma taught that the gospel had a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword. And President Benson declared that missionary work is, quote, the real answer to the world's problems. 
As we participate in the great missionary program of the church, we join with Christ and contribute to Satan's eventual defeat. What a tremendous message of hope for us. So in conclusion, the book of Revelation is a timeless masterpiece. Its message is not primarily one about the end of the world, but rather it is about the myriad of blessings that God seeks to bestow upon his people. It is about what is possible when people turn to God, live his laws and thus overcome Satan's influence. Although Revelation mainly concentrates on the cosmic battle, we should always be aware that as Arthur Wainwright writes, the battle between good and evil takes place not only in the arena of history, but also in human hearts. Therefore, the message of comfort and hope expressed in Revelation also provides valid lessons for each of us during our own individual struggles with Satan's influence. And I say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.